I'm going to introduce Dr. Schimmer. Thank you for being here. He's an assistant professor of the reproductive endocrinology and infertility at Emory. Uh, Dr. Schimmer has a strong interest in oncofertility uh, and research related to fertility preservation and the treatment of infertility. He has worked as a guest researcher in the CDC uh, with the Center for Disease Control and Prevention related to ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, and more recently has published research related to fertility preservation in pediatric cancer survivors. Dr. Schimmer has also a professional interest in healthcare informatics and currently serves as director of the healthcare informatics for Emory Reproductive Center. And he will be talking to us about obstetrics and cardiovascular considerations in patients with infertility. Thank you. Dr. Shima, welcome. Well, thank you for that nice introduction and uh, good morning. Um, I am uh, having some difficulty with this as well. Sorry, hold on one second. <laughs> I was kind of worried about this. Let's see. I'm going to turn it off and on. Hmm. Oop. Is it a reception issue? Okay. So financial disclosures, I work as a consultant for a uh, startup that's doing research on ultrasound, but uh, has nothing to do with anything in this presentation. And my objectives today are, um, first of all, to discuss preconception risk assessment for women with heart disease who are considering family building, to discuss fertility treatment in women with heart disease, to discuss the management of couples with her heritable heart disease, and to discuss the use of a gestational carrier for women who have an unacceptable risk of morbidity or mortality uh, during pregnancy because of heart disease. So I was told it would be a good idea to put these at the beginning here. Um, and I suppose this is good because it's not a test of the content I'm about to present here. But um, let's start with question one here on the top. And I think I'm supposed to press, have everyone press the power button on their, uh, their controllers here. And I was told I'm supposed to press a to start the polling. So question number one here, what criteria are recommended for preconception risk assessment in women with heart disease who are contemplating pregnancy? I'll give everybody a few, maybe let's say 30 seconds or so. Okay, and I'm going to press, I think, B now to show the results. Okay, so we see a mix of answers, and I'll give you that it's A, but we're going to talk about this a little bit more and, and why this is. Um, and let me go ahead and see if I can reset this now. Okay, and then um, question two. Which of the following is not a contraindication to pregnancy? Give everybody a few seconds here to record their answers. And let's see if I can bring these up now. Okay, A is the um, prevailing answer, and I would, I would agree. And then um, question three, true or false, it is possible for a woman with a contraindication to pregnancy to safely have a child who is her genetic offspring. see the results real time, I think. Oh, wait, I don't think I started the polling. Hold on, here we go. See a lot of true, and the answer is yes, and we'll talk about how. And then the last question, it is possible to prevent heritable heart disease from being passed on to children? And hold on, let me start this, there we go. And just looking at the uh, sample sizes here, thank you everybody for participating, this is great. Um, and the answer is going to be A, we'll talk about how this can happen. Um, so let me see if I can hide this, okay, there we go. Okay, so in terms of pretreatment risk assessment, um, oops. Hmm. There we go, Ooh. I think I just jumped a few slides there, okay. Um, so first of all, any patient that comes into our office, and this isn't just me as a reproductive endocrinologist, this is an OBGYN, a primary care doctor, a cardiologist, 
should have, who's, who's planning on pregnancy or who may be planning on pregnancy, should have a risk assessment performed uh, to see what the risks are during pregnancy of having pregnancy-related morbidity and, and, uh, and potentially mortality. And this primarily consists of taking a thorough history, doing a physical exam, and making sure to encourage patients to discuss all prior diagnoses and medical concerns. And sometimes I even say, are there any concerns that a doctor has brought up to you that maybe you didn't agree with, um, but, but that somebody suggested might be an issue for you? It is very surprising how often, after asking questions in an open-ended way, a patient will say, actually, you know, I was coming here because I was having problems getting pregnant, but yes, I do have high blood pressure and I do have prediabetes. Were those relevant? I didn't know if I should even mention it. And the answer is yes, they're very relevant, but patients often don't think to bring it up to us. Um, and then also, many of our patients will not sort of be in care with us consistently, but will come and go. So especially as a reproductive endocrinologist, we may help somebody to conceive. They may then go to their OBGYN, deliver, have their baby, and come back to us a couple of years later. And it's very important to take an interval history because in many cases we'll find out that somebody had a hypertensive disorder of pregnancy, was diagnosed with hypertension after pregnancy, had postpartum cardiomyopathy or other complications that are very relevant to their safety in their next pregnancy um, that they may not think to bring up. And let's see, hold on a second. Sorry about the slight delay here. Okay, there we go, okay. So um, in terms of um, patients with heart disease, they should be assessed for two different types of, of uh, risk, preconception risk and pretreatment risk if they're planning on fertility treatment. And I'm going to talk about under what scenarios somebody with heart disease may actually be going through fertility treatment. Counseling patients who have heart disease about fertility and childbearing is very complex. And Patients with a high risk of morbidity and mortality may be good candidates for IVF with a gestational surrogate, a gestational carrier. Consultation with a reproductive endocrinologist is recommended for any patient who has a high risk of morbidity and mortality during pregnancy because in many cases, although as a cardiologist, uh, you may tell somebody your risk of having an adverse event during pregnancy is extremely high, maybe unacceptably so, that doesn't mean that she can't complete childbearing, and it doesn't mean she can't complete childbearing with her own eggs and have a genetic offspring. And I'm gonna talk about how that works. So first of all, let's talk about stratifying car the risk of cardiac-related complications during pregnancy. And you're gonna hear more about this from, um, from um, somebody who is a cardiologist and not a fertility doctor. Sorry, give me one second. There we go, okay. But in general, patients who are at risk for cardiac-related complications during pregnancy um, should be referred to a cardiologist with expertise in pregnancy and congenital or acquired heart disease and a maternal fetal medicine specialist. And I refer my patients to both um, simply because a cardiologist is absolutely the best person to assess their uh, risk factors for morbidity and mortality during pregnancy, but also to optimize uh, care so that when they do get pregnant, they're in their healthiest possible state but during pregnancy, a maternal fetal medicine specialist, this is a specialist in sort of high-risk pregnancy or medically complex pregnancies, is going to be intimately involved with their management. And when possible, having a preconception visit with that doctor to establish a strategy is a great idea. Um, some of the MFM practices around town are so busy seeing pregnant patients that they have difficulty getting preconception visits in. We try whenever we can. And what is a cardiologist likely to do? And again, this is, a, this is a little outside of my wheelhouse and much more in the wheelhouse of almost everybody else here. But generally speaking, this will be a detailed history, information on prior interventions and maybe surgeries that were done uh, previously as a child, symptom status, physical exam, EKG, an echocardiogram, and an assessment of the patient's functional status. And very often, this will also include exercise stress testing to see where they are before they actually conceive and whether things need to be optimized before they get pregnant, either with fertility treatment or naturally. Oops. So how do we then stratify patients in terms of telling them what their risks are? So this is a patient with heart disease. How do we tell them 
here's your risk factor, or here's the level of risk that you're facing if you do become pregnant. The 2018 ACC and AHA guidelines and the 2018 um, European Society of Cardiology guidelines recommend using the modified WHO classification system because uh, they say this is the best predictive model for cardiovascular risk in pregnancy. This was based on a series of studies looking at these classification systems and calculating the area under, curve as, area under the curve as it related to the um, ability of these systems to predict cardiac risk and the modified WHO classification came out um, on top. And I wanted to talk through them briefly. So with respect to the WHO classification system, they divide patients into four uh, categories. Patients who have um, class one conditions have no detectable increased risk of maternal mortality and either no or mild increased risk of maternal morbidity. Examples include a small patent ductus arteriosus, mild uh, pulmonic stenosis, mitral valve prolapse. Patients with class two conditions have a small increased risk of maternal mortality. These are patients with um, an unrepaired ASD or VSD, a repaired tetralogy of flow, many different types of arrhythmias, and they're sort of an in-between category, which is class two or three. And these are patients, or class two to three, these are patients with mild left ventricular impairment, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, Marfan syndrome um, with an aortic root size of less than four millimeters um, um, and uh, without aortic dissection. Sorry, let's, um, there we go. Patients with class three conditions face a significant risk of maternal mortality or severe morbidity during pregnancy. So examples of this are patients with a mechanical valve unrepaired cyanotic heart disease, Marfan syndrome with a larger aortic diameter, Fontan circulation without complications, or other complex congenital heart diseases. And then patients with class four conditions. Generally speaking, these are patients who we will tell have a contraindication to pregnancy. We encourage these patients not to carry a pregnancy um, because of their risks. And these are patients with severe mitral stenosis, a bicuspid aortic valve with an ascending aorta diameter of more than five centimeters, Marfan syndrome with an aortic uh, dilation of more than 4.5 centimeters, um, systemic left ventricular systolic dysfunction with an uh, ejection fraction of less than 30%, severe coarctation, Fontan circulation without complications, severe pulmonary artery uh, hypertension. These are patients who are going to say, we recommend that you do not conceive. And this is one of the very few times in which a gynecologist or a reproductive endocrinologist will actually tell a woman, we consider pregnancy contraindicated. Most of the time, discussions about risks of medical problems during pregnancy is more of a continuum and a spectrum. Yes, there are risks. Here's what they, here what they are. But these types of conditions, we say, please don't get pregnant if, if, uh, if you're at all willing to, uh, you know, to do that. And, and what can we do for these patients? Does it mean that they cannot have a family? Does it mean that they have to adopt? It does not. Women with a moderate or high risk of mortality or severe morbidity can still get pregnant and have a family. And this involves using a gestational carrier, the sort of the term that most people are familiar with is surrogate. A gestational carrier is somebody who will carry the pregnancy on behalf of the patient. And this is somebody who is most often recruited through an agency. There are agencies that specialize in this. They integrate sort of a law firm and then an agency that has uh, at least enough medical expertise to recognize who's a good surrogate and who isn't. Um, sometimes, rarely, this is a family member or a very close friend of a patient, but that's actually the exception, not the norm. What are we looking for in a gestational carrier? We're looking for somebody, first of all, who has been pregnant before and who had a healthy pregnancy and delivery. Ideally, we want this person to be under 45 years old, but keep in mind, this isn't her egg. It's not the gestational carrier's egg, it's the patient's egg. And so if the patient's much younger and the gestational uh, carrier's a bit older, her age is not nearly as relevant uh, to her pregnancy outcomes as it would be if the gestational carrier was trying to carry a pregnancy herself. We want to make sure, of course, that the gestational carrier has no serious medical comorbidities, um, we'll always do preconception testing on these patients, so before we move forward, we'll do uh, tests to make sure that there's nothing medically wrong that, that would lead us to want to choose somebody different. These patients, the patients who are going to be the intended parents and the gestational carrier, and then finally both together, 
meet with a psychologist who has relevant experience in this field, somebody who's used to counseling patients about gestational carrier use. And if there are any concerns from a, a psychosocial standpoint, these are patients, uh, we'll then move on to a different carrier. And finally, once we're sure that we have a carrier who's suitable and that everybody feels very comfortable moving forward with her, we'll have an attorney with relevant experience execute a legal contract between the carrier and the intended parents. Now, surrogacy is not legal in every state in the United States. Many states have ambiguous or no laws regulating surrogacy, and under those circumstances, what we'll do is say, the contract that you establish with an attorney usually prevails. In Michigan or New York, there are some places where you really can't use a carrier, and so sometimes they'll use an out-of-state carrier instead. Um, let's see, there we go, okay. And then how does this work? So how do we use the intended parent's eggs to help uh, her conceive using a gestational carrier? I'm gonna talk to you about how IVF works because it relates to what we offer patients. Um, but basically, the intended parents, the woman with heart disease in this case, assuming that she is healthy enough to go through in vitro fertilization, and many people are, will go through in vitro fertilization. During this process, we'll stimulate her ovaries. I'm gonna to talk to you about how, how we do that. We'll perform an egg retrieval, which is a very minor procedure, and collect eggs from her ovaries. We make embryos, and one thing that's important to know is that even if your patient is young, you've had a difficult conversation with her about her risk factors and her risk of mortality during pregnancy, she can come see me whenever she feels comfortable, and probably the sooner the better. I can make embryos for her any time in advance of her actually building her family with the gestational carrier. And we'll talk about why, but the younger the better from a pregnancy outcome standpoint. So we can make embryos asynchronously with, with using a carrier for her to get pregnant. Embryos can stay frozen indefinitely. But when it's time for her to actually conceive and build her family, her gestational carrier will take estrogen for a couple of weeks to build a thick lining in her uterus to support a pregnancy. She'll take progesterone to uh, cause changes in that lining to allow it to accommodate a pregnancy. And I'll show you how this works from a technical standpoint, but we put an embryo back inside her uterine cavity that was conceived using the intended parent's eggs and, and her partner or, or sometimes a donor's sperm. The embryo transfer um, is a straightforward procedure. The chance of live birth is related to the age of the intended parent at the time that she made her embryos. So even if it was 10 years before and now she's 45, if she made her embryos when she was 35, the chance of live birth reflects that of the, her 35-year-old eggs. And then the intended parents take custody of the infant following delivery. Some gestational carriers agree to pump and supply breast milk for uh, some period of time afterwards. That's quite common. And how does IVF work? Because if you're referring patients for IVF and these are patients with heart disease, important to understand what the procedure involves. So with IVF, the first step is that normally a woman's ovary will make one mature egg grow each month. But with IVF, we know there's a lot of attrition between harvesting an egg and getting a usable embryo. So it'd be very inefficient if we only collected one egg every single month. As a result, what we do is first stimulate the ovaries to make lots of mature eggs by having the patient take injectable gonadotropins. What are these FSH, LH? Um, we add a third medication on to prevent ovulation, which is a GnRH receptor antagonist. And she'll take these by self-injection for about 10 to 12 days on average. Sometimes this sounds very intimidating to patients, but for those who have a relative or a friend or personal history of diabetes, I explain it's very similar, 30 to 32 gauge needle and administered in a subcuticular fashion. Uh, generally speaking, patients find these to be very, very tolerable. During this time, she comes in a lot to our clinic. So this is the ovary here, and you can see these little black circles are actually growing follicles. Eggs grow within the follicles themselves, and basically, we're trying to get as many of these to develop as possible, but we need to keep a really close eye while she's going through stimulation. So that means vaginal ultrasound and blood work probably five or six times over a 10 to 12 day stretch of time. After she's finished stimulating her ovaries, we induce ovulation um, and we perform an egg retrieval under uh, sedation. 
So the patient goes uh, under propofol-monitored anesthesia care, propofol-MAC. And while she's sleeping, we place a vaginal ultrasound probe in. I'm just trying to flip to the next slide, or I've got a close-up here. There we go. Um, we'll place a vaginal ultrasound probe in, and we'll run a needle along the top of the probe through her vagina into her ovaries to collect eggs from the ovaries. You can see this close-up here. The needle comes in. Um, it's a beveled needle that applies gentle suction inside the follicle, and the egg gets kind of plucked off the wall of the follicle. Hopefully, it's mature and able to be fertilized. Seems very invasive to patients, and one of the reasons why is that every textbook dating back to high school or even sixth grade that shows the uterus shows the ovaries suspended off to the side like this, as does this diagram here. In point of fact, they actually usually hang down behind the uterus, and they're literally about a centimeter from the vaginal cuff, which is quite thin. The patient's asleep. From a procedural standpoint, and I tell patients this ahead of time, most people, of course, don't remember anything about the retrieval itself, but wake up and have either mild cramping or sometimes no cramping. The majority of people just need some Tylenol or an NSAID. Once in a while, someone needs an opiate. In many cases, people actually just decline any type of pain medication at all. So very uh, minimally painful and disruptive recovery. Most people find uh, that they're uh, able to go back to work the following day. They're certainly discharged quickly. Uh, propofol wears off very fast with few side effects. And generally speaking, it's a quick recovery. And I wanted to kind of go through what we do next. Hold on one second. Here we go. So after the egg retrieval, we have oocytes, single cell. Right before ovulation, they go through meiosis and, and essentially are now, um, have 23 chromosomes and are ready to be fertilized. There are a couple ways of fertilizing eggs. One is we can actually just put the sperm, if the, man, uh, the male partner or the sperm donor, whomever she's conceiving with, has an adequate sperm count, we put the sperm into the petri dish and let them go find the egg and fertilize the egg naturally. If we're doing genetic testing, which I'm going to talk to you about in a minute here, or if the sperm count is less than ideal, we'll actually just go ahead and inject the sperm directly into the egg. This is called ICSI, intracytoplasmic sperm injection. And the hope is that after about five to six days in culture, we have a blastocyst stage embryo. So we've gone from two cells to about 110 cells here. And a blastocyst stage embryo is ultimately our goal when somebody's trying to conceive. Um, I'm just trying to flip to the next slide here. Might need a little help with this one. There we go. Okay. Um, a blastocyst stage embryo is the mature embryo that we would put back in the uh, woman's uterus, and I'm going to talk to you about the chance of live birth. The short answer is that uh, I think our most recent numbers in a woman under 35, we'd have about a 65% chance of live birth when we put that embryo back in her uterus at Emory. Um, if it does vary by clinic. But essentially, we can do a couple of things. One, we can do an embryo transfer, which I'm about to show you. Or two, as I mentioned, we can freeze embryos. Embryos have about, as I said, 110 cells in them with modern what's called vitrification technique, very, very rapid uh, cooling when we do the freezing process. We're able to freeze these embryos in a way that survival rates exceed 95%. So when they come out of uh, the cryopreservation process, they have a very, very high chance of being alive, viable, and, and uh, able to, to uh, result in pregnancy. Embryo cryopreservation is great when somebody's in a committed relationship, for example, and knows who she, that she wants to conceive with her current partner. It lets us know what we have, because not every single egg turns into an embryo. There's a lot of attrition between when we harvest eggs and when we get embryos. But um, it's not always ideal for patients who are young and uh, are worried about age-related decline in their fertility and, and don't have a partner with whom they are certain they want to conceive. So for people in that situation who may want to go through uh, fertility preservation, um, we can actually freeze eggs instead of embryos. And with modern technology, egg freezing and thawing survival rates are about as good as they are for embryos. So very um, popular method of uh, fertility preservation, I think increasingly so recently. And then finally, um, I might need help with this slide, sorry. Um, the, uh, the embryo transfer. A lot of people are worried this is going to involve some kind of major surgery. It does not. An embryo transfer basically involves placing a vaginal speculum 
placing a flexible catheter through the cervix into the uterus and releasing the embryo under ultrasound guidance in the uterus. Most people who go through this say that it feels sort of like getting a, a long pap smear for a point of reference, and so not something where we're going to have to put them to sleep and do some kind of procedure that involves a long recovery. What are the chances of live birth? Let's uh, yeah, advance one. There we go. Um, the numbers change every year a little bit, um, and this is a bit of a shameless plug for Emory, so sorry about that. But um, generally speaking, chance of live birth varies a lot with the woman's age. So um, down here we see the woman's age. Um, here on the y-axis we see uh, the chance of live birth, which is the metric of, of concern, of course, not pregnancy rate or, or uh, embryo production rate, but what are the chances of having a baby? A, a good 60% or so for women who are under 35 were actually a little higher than that more recently. But one of the important things is that we do have a significant decline in the chance of live birth as a woman ages. Which is why if you're counseling somebody and she may want to have children, but she may not feel ready to do that, whether she has heart disease or not, it's very reasonable to send her to a reproductive endocrinologist early so that we don't lose our window of opportunity. Let's go ahead and move one slide there. Um, in terms of the inheritance of heart disease, so I've talked to you about IVF. I'm going to talk to you about how we can use this for people with heritable conditions. First of all, unfortunately, not all heart disease has a known single gene causative uh, mutation. In many cases, people have congenital heart disease, and we know that there is an increased risk that their children will have congenital heart disease but we can't tell them exactly what gene is causing it, and so this is the type of heart disease that I, I actually can't prevent um, in, in subsequent generations. The most frequent recurrent defects that are somewhat heritable, ventricular septal defects, coarctation of the aorta, hypoplastic left heart syndrome. This is not something that I can do IVF with genetic testing to assist with, but genetic counseling is always very helpful for these patients so they understand their level of risk. Let's move one slide. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is an example of a condition that in many cases I actually can prevent, um, and I wanted to talk about how this happens. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy um, is a genetic disease that causes left ventricular hypertrophy, which can then lead to left ventricular outflow dis uh, obstruction, diastolic dysfunction, myocardial ischemia, mitral regurgitation. And although it can be caused by many different types of mutations, we can usually identify the mutation that's causing it. One of the scary things for patients about this is that there's highly variable penetrance. And so, to give you an idea, I have a patient um, who came to see me recently who herself had absolutely no abnormalities on testing, no functional impairment, was completely healthy, carried a mutation in MYH7. Her brother carried the same mutation and had a heart transplant, as had several other family members. Which is scary because she couldn't simply get pregnant and say, well, I'm okay, so my child will be. She was worried, what happens if my child is in the same uh, sort of risk category as all of uh, my, my other family members who've had really serious outcomes? Next slide. There are other heritable causes of cardiac disease as well. So Duchenne muscular dystrophy, I've actually diagnosed this twice, and it was a complete surprise to the patient both times. We often offer genetic carrier screening to patients coming in to see us with infertility just to see if they carry, they and their partner carry something like cystic fibrosis, spinal muscular atrophy, a recessive genetic disease usually that would cause no problem for them, but, but if they both had it, would have a risk of causing a, a, a child to have a serious disease. One of the things that they screen for on this panel is Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, and this is an X-linked disease with a severe phenotype uh, in males but women, because it's X-linked, often don't know that they have it. They have no uh, limitations whatsoever, or they have no problems until pregnancy. It is important to um, send patients who do have this, female patients with this, to a cardiologist before they conceive, and often they'll get a TTE and EKG, just to make sure that there are no changes that would impair their, their ability to carry a pregnancy safely. So we always refer these patients, but this is often shocking, that if they had a male, that male would have a very high risk of having a disease. Becker muscular dystrophy, myotonic dystrophy, Emery Dreyfus muscular dystrophy, um, uh, fascio-scapulo-humeral muscular dystrophy, Friedrich ataxia, Bart syndrome, 
All of these are diseases with single gene mutations that, that can be passed on to a child. Next slide. And so a patient with heart disease that has a suspect, suspected genetic cause should be referred to a genetic counselor with experience counseling patients with heart disease. Patients with heart disease um, that has an identifiable single gene mutation that is causative should be referred to a reproductive endocrinologist for counseling. And that's because with IVF using pre-implantation genetic testing, I can usually, we can usually prevent this from being passed on to a subsequent generation. Next slide. How does this work? So I mentioned to you how we culture embryos and how embryos can be put back in the uterus. But there's one step that I didn't mention before, and that is that we can um, have our lab do something called a trophectoderm biopsy. This is a targeting reticle for a laser that's built into our embryology microscopes. And you can see they've just used it to make an incision in the zona pellucida, the sort of the shell that surrounds the outside of the, the embryo. They make this incision, they wait a little while, the uh, trophectoderm, and you can see this is a little bit nuanced embryo anatomy. This is called the inner cell mass that will form the baby. There's a fluid pocket here which is difficult to perceive because it's a 2D picture. And then on the outside you can see these, this sort of monolayer of cells that's called the trophectoderm which will eventually become the placenta. They allow part of the trophectoderm to uh, basically herniate through the zona pellucida at the incision point and then they remove a few cells, so seven to 10 cells of the trophectoderm. And you're thinking, goodness, what's gonna to happen to this embryo? Every one of these cells at this point is omnipotent. So all of these cells can actually form an identical twin. The embryo doesn't mind losing a couple of them, doesn't damage the embryo to do this. Um, next slide. I'm gonna to talk to you about the specifics, but once we have those cells, we can screen them to see two things. One, does the embryo have normal chromosomes or not? And two, does it carry a disease of concern? Now, one thing that we don't have, we can screen for pretty much any known single gene mutation, but we have to know it's there. We don't have the technology to screen an embryo to see if it carries anything. We have to know if the parent carries it first before we can screen the embryo. And the strategy, and I'm gonna to talk to you about the details in a second, is if an embryo has a problem, it's chromosomally aneuploid or it carries the disease of concern, um, it's not transferred. If no problem is identified, euploid embryo, no disease, it can be transferred to the, back to the, the woman or to a gestational carrier. Next slide. The details of how this works I think are interesting. Um, and uh, basically the way it works is after the cells are taken from the embryo, they're lysed and there actually is an insufficient amount of DNA in the cell sample, because it's only seven to 10 cells, to, to do the genetic testing they need to do. So the first step is whole genome amplification. And this basically randomly amplifies segments of the, uh, the, the, the entire chromosome, I'm sorry, the entire genome from the embryo. And at that point, they do a couple of different tests. First of all, they do copy number variation analysis. This is actually done through next generation sequencing and they determine, is the embryo euploid or aneuploid? Because you don't want to transfer an embryo that you know, doesn't have Duchenne's muscular dystrophy but does have Down syndrome or some other complication that would result in a miscarriage or no pregnancy. The embryo is then screened to see if the gene of concern is present, so just looking at single nucleotide variations. That's insufficient to test an embryo and reassure ourselves that there isn't a risk because what happens if the whole genome amplification process didn't amplify the segment of the genome that carried that specific gene. That's called allelic dropout, and it's a scary uh, prospect when you're doing genetic testing to make sure a baby isn't affected by whatever their parents carry. So they also do linkage analysis and analyze um, to see if the segment of chromosome that carries the gene of concern was inherited by the embryo. And so using that and a specific targeted search for the gene of concern, the mutation of concern, they can tell whether or not the embryo has the disease or not. Next slide. Now, it's an amazing technology and we use it very frequently. Um, it is possible, as I mentioned, to make sure that we are transferring embryos that are euploid and free of, or for autosomal recessive conditions, just a carrier of disease-causing mutations. It's not perfect. The probability of one single IVF cycle producing an embryo that has these characteristics is somewhat low. 
there's a moderate likelihood of having no euploid unaffected embryos per transfer. And then once we get a euploid unaffected embryo, a healthy embryo, after we put it back, the chances are 65, 70% that it will become a live born baby. It's also expensive. It's covered in many cases, but there are a lot of people who don't have access to IVF through their insurance. So some companies cover it. It tends to be bigger companies. Um, for example, Emory covers it. There, there are many companies here in Georgia that do. There are 13 states in the country that will cover IVF, but not necessarily the pre-implantation genetic testing aspect of care. The fact is that it's a major area where access needs to improve. It's a major disparity because IVF without coverage, twenty to twenty-five thousand dollars when you're when you're doing uh, genetic testing along with the uh, the IVF process itself. Next slide. And just to give you an idea, um, and we are very candid and transparent about patients when. Patients, when they looked at a, a group of patients who were only trying to make embryos that had normal chromosomes and weren't then excluding more embryos that carried a disease, it, in a huge number of patients, about 50% had three or fewer embryos to biopsy. So after we'd harvested their eggs and made embryos, there are many that had three or fewer embryos to biopsy, and 20% only had one embryo to biopsy. And so I'm very transparent with patients from the start when I'm counseling about this that, yes, we can do this, but it may take me a few cycles to get a, a healthy embryo. And if the plan is to bank healthy embryos, it might even take me a couple of cycles. Next slide. Now, what are the holdups? I mentioned age-related decline in fertility. Why do I encourage everybody to send their patients early? The window that we have to treat people declines rapidly. So to give you an idea, in a woman who's under 35 years old, a couple, let's take a male-female couple trying to conceive, the risk that they will spend a year trying to conceive and not get pregnant is about 15%. So the, the chance of infertility is about 15%. By 40, it's one in two. And by 44, it's actually somewhat unusual to get pregnant. Now, we all know that people do, and we all know that somebody who's gotten pregnant at 46 years old naturally. Popular media does us no favors when we hear about the Kardashians or Janet Jackson. They neglect to mention the, the egg donor or the, uh, the, the embryos that have been frozen. But what happens essentially is the risk of aneuploidy in an embryo, these are biopsied embryos, goes up substantially by age. Something that awareness, we, we lack awareness in medicine of this. There have been some publicity campaigns that were intended to improve awareness, but there was a lot of backlash where people felt that they were kind of being coerced to, to have a family earlier or to do something they didn't want to do. But the fact is we do have a limited window. So we encourage people, if your patient is going to potentially need reproductive services or, or may become less healthy over time, or for any reason may want to preserve her fertility or, or to build a family, the earlier the better. Next, uh, next slide. So um, what about IVF in particular in women with heart disease? The bottom line is that IVF is a very low risk procedure. It involves, as I said, monitored anesthesia care, typically for about 30 minutes. The egg retrieval is usually performed in a, a procedure room within a fertility clinic. And, often in a medical office building that's separate from an ASC or hospital. It's typically completed without intubation, without inhalation anesthesia. And when patients come in with heart disease, we send them for a risk assessment with their cardiologist, and then we also send them to the anesthesia team that will be performing the anesthesia to make sure they're comfortable with it. We love having uh, early involvement of our cardiology colleagues so that we can, the patient has a sense of what her risks are for this. Um, let's go to the next slide. And one of the important considerations is that your patient may go to a private practice or a local clinic and be told, no, I'm sorry, we, we can't safely treat you here. But it doesn't mean she has no options necessarily. Private practice, and again, I'm not making generalizations. We have a really lovely clinic too, and Emory uh, thankfully helped us build a, a beautiful facility. But this isn't us, this is another clinic. Their procedure rooms may look something like this. And this is great for the vast majority of patients who have few or no risk factors for complications during their egg retrieval. But this group may also tell this patient, I'm sorry, our anesthesiologist uh, group and our, our facilities aren't adequate to safely do an egg retrieval. That doesn't necessarily mean they can't. When we're at a big tertiary care center, so Emory, another academic center, a big medical uh, complex where there's integration between the IVF or the, the reproductive endocrinology group and the hospital, we've done egg retrievals in facilities like this. We've gone to our main operating room. It's more expensive. The patient has to pay a facility fee. It requires a lot of complex planning because 
we have two days notice before we do our egg retrieval and sometimes the OR doesn't love opening a spot at an exact time and guaranteeing us access. So we've, we've struggled a little, but we've managed to work out the kinks. And we've done this many times for patients safely where the uh, anesthesia team says, in this setting with the resources we have, we can do this safely. Next slide. This is not, and I looked, there's no information that I could find specifically about the safety of IVF in the setting of heart disease. But what I wanted to emphasize is the procedural risks with IVF in general are extremely low. Um, in a big study, the risk of having any complication documented was about, was less than 1%, about 0.75%. Uh, um, about half a percent of patients required hospitalization uh, after their egg retrieval. Um, one in a thousand required surgery due to a complication. What are these complications? Bleeding intra-abdominally, um, infection, damage to the bowel, bladder, blood vessels. It's usually bleeding if it's going to happen. And the odds of having a severe enough complication that one needs to have surgery is under, it's about one in a thousand. So we always tell patients there's a little risk to this. It's an extremely low procedural risk. What are things that correlate with that? A high number of eggs retrieved, a longer uh, egg retrieval, probably meaning that it was a complicated case. Um, inexperience of the surgeon, a younger uh, age of the patient, not the surgeon, hopefully, and uh, a, a lower BMI, uh, again, for the patient. Um, let's go to the next slide. And um, this is my group. I am very, very lucky to work with the, an amazing team. Um, so we are always happy to, uh, to take consults and to hear from you. Thank you.